Greetings in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We started a new series last week called Life Detox. Why is it important? Because toxic emotions affect our loved ones. It affects our family members. It affects our relationships. And more importantly, it affects our testimony, our walk with the Lord. Emotions are barometers. They reflect the health of our spiritual life. What do I mean? Spiritual maturity, as I mentioned last week, and emotional maturity go hand in hand. Emotional maturity reflects our relationship with God, reflects our spiritual maturity. Today, I want to talk about depression. Because depression is related to anxiety. Anxiety is connected with fear. What you're afraid of eventually results in anxiety. You begin to think ahead. This may happen to me. That may happen to me. And if you're not able to control it, it leads to depression. What do we mean by depression? Depression is an emotional feeling of sadness. You're overwhelmed. You feel out of control. You feel helpless. You feel hopeless. You feel like giving up. Eventually, if you're not careful, depression can lead to suicide. The issue of depression, suicide, is very relevant. More people are depressed today because of this lockdown, because of this pandemic. And I was surprised to learn that from ages 15 to 29, young people, the second leading cause of death is what? Can you guess? Suicide. How do we overcome depression? How do we gain victory over depression? Some of you may be struggling with depression or anxiety or fear. I pray that this message will help you. If you are not struggling with this kind of problem, this will help you help others to overcome depression. Let us have a quick review based on last Sunday's message on the four R's to overcome negative toxic emotions. What do we mean by the four R's? Number one, you have to realize that we all do struggle with stress, with negative emotions. Admit it. The second R is go to the root problem. You cannot solve your problem unless you go to the root. And number three, you will discover most of our root problem is about the way we think. So you need to recalibrate your mind, recalibrate your thinking. And lastly, wrong thinking many times is because of failure to recognize who God is. A proper view of God is indispensable to be thinking properly. Today, I want to focus more on the last two. The importance of recalibrating your thinking and the importance of recognizing God. Let's look at 1 Kings chapter 19. This is an amazing story and there are many lessons we can learn. Let's begin. 1 Kings chapter 19, let me read for you. Verse 1 to 3, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And the Bible tells us Elijah became afraid. He arose and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Who is Jezebel? Jezebel was the wife of King Ahab. If you read the Bible, Jezebel was very wicked. She was the woman behind 
the evils of King Ahab. She was a great influence, not for good, but for evil. In 1 Kings 19, the Bible tells us, King Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now, what did Elijah accomplish? You won't believe this. In 1 Kings chapter 18, one of the most amazing spiritual victory was accomplished by Elijah. You have to understand, Elijah was a man of faith. Elijah was very courageous. Look at what he did. The Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah gathered all the false prophets of Israel in Mount Carmel. Let me read for you. Now then, send gather to me all Israel at Mount Carmel together with 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So you have the worship of a false god by the name of Baal and the worship of a lady goddess called Asherah. These were financed by Jezebel. It is a state-sponsored religion. Horrible. Now, the challenge was this. Very important. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. In other words, Elijah, full of faith and courage, challenged the entire nation of Israel. And he said, make up your mind. If Baal is God, worship him. If the Lord is God, worship him. I believe this is so crucial today. You have to decide for yourself who is the God of your life. Now put yourself in that situation. All the false prophets in one corner, and you have one person, Elijah alone. And what was the challenge? He said, you bring one ox, offer it to your God, but don't put fire underneath the altar. On my part, I will have one ox, I will display it on the altar, but we will not put any fire underneath the altar. And the God who answered our prayer by sending fire from heaven is the God that we will worship. My goodness, the people like the challenge. Everybody got so excited. Then the Bible tells us, the prophets of Baal, they prayed and prayed. They did all the rituals. Nothing happened. And then it was time for Elijah to pray. And this is what Elijah did. He prayed to the Lord. His prayer was God-centered. He simply said, Lord, let the people know that you are the true God. Let the people know so that their hearts will be turned to you. And after praying, the Bible tells us in 1 Kings chapter 18, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and lick up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And you know what happened? The Bible tells us, Elijah told all the people, Kill all the false prophets. 850 false prophets died. Do you think that was a tremendous victory for God and for Elijah? Of course. Elijah demonstrated God's power. God vindicated Elijah. God demonstrated his power through fire. And you will think Elijah will be so excited. Yes, he was excited. But notice what happened. Verse 2. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, May the gods do to me. And even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. What did Jezebel do? Jezebel threatened 
the life of Elijah. Now, what did Elijah do? Verse 3, he was afraid. He arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba. If you look at the map of Israel, you will notice Mount Carmel is in the northern part of Israel. And 100 kilometers downward, you have Beersheba, the southern part of Israel. Elijah ran from Jezebel. He was so scared. After running for over 100 kilometers, the Bible tells us he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, came to and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. O Lord, take my life. I am not better than my father's. Elijah became depressed. Elijah became suicidal. He wanted to die. In fact, because he knew the Bible, that he cannot commit suicide, he asked God to just kill him. Lord, it is better. You take my life now. I am not better than my fathers. What does that mean? I am not better than my fathers. You know what Elijah is saying? I am a failure. My ministry is useless. Let me tell you why he felt that way. Elijah was expecting a spiritual revival. Elijah was thinking, with all the demonstration of God's power, King Ahab would have been transformed. Jezebel would have been converted. That was his expectations. And it did not happen. On the contrary, they threatened his life. And that's why he felt so depressed. He felt like, I am a failure, Lord. Take my life. You see, my friend, how you think, what you think will impact your emotions. For Elijah, he was a failure. Depression can happen to anybody, including Elijah, a man of God. So what can we learn? Remember, to deal with negative emotions, it is important that you remember the 4R principle. You realize it can happen to anybody. You go to the root problem. For Elijah, you will notice the root problem is not Jezebel. The root problem is where is God in the midst of all of these threats? And I want to focus on the importance of recalibrating your mind and recognizing God. You will see what God did in order to recalibrate the mind of Elijah, in order for Elijah to recognize who God is. God took the initiative. The Bible tells us Elijah was so discouraged, he was so down, he fell asleep. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree. And behold, there was an angel touching him. And he said to him, Arise. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time, touched him and said, Arise. It, because the journey is too great for you. He arose, ate, and drank. He went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. You will notice, God wanted Elijah to know he really loves him. God cared for Elijah. God cares. How do you know? Look at how God took care of the physical needs of Elijah. God's approach when it comes to solving our depression is holistic. For example, in this case, God provided Elijah rest, allowed him to sleep. God provided food because sometimes diet affects our emotions. God provided water. 
But what is the root problem? Let's find out. Then he came to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you notice God wanted to go to the root problem? God is now talking to Elijah's heart. God wanted Elijah to ask his own heart. What are you doing here, Elijah? And notice the answer of Elijah. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. God was helping Elijah go to the root problem. This question was repeated again. In the same chapter, God asked Elijah, What are you doing here? Why is that important? Because to solve any emotional problem, you got to go to the root. And to solve the root problem, God wanted Elijah to recalibrate his thinking. What do we mean? Elijah was demonstrating a victim mindset. Look at what he said. I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. In Tagalog, Elijah is namamakawa. Kawawa naman ako. Lord, I'm the only one left. They seek my life. They want to take it away. Elijah somehow has forgotten that God is more powerful than Jezebel. So what is the cure? Well, let me describe to you first the importance of calibrating your mind. In the case of Elijah, he developed a victim mindset. You blame others. I've seen people, every time there's a problem, they focus on others. It's his fault. It's her fault. You blame your past. You blame circumstances. You don't assume responsibility. What do you mean by biblical mindset? A biblical mindset, you assume responsibility. You realize you're responsible for your response, for your reaction. You are proactive. Remember last Sunday, you do your best with what you can, what is within your control. What is outside your control, you surrender to the Lord. That's a basic biblical mindset. Gives excuses. I know people, they don't assume responsibility. They just keep giving excuses and they feel helpless. You know why? That's how you become depressed. You feel you cannot do anything. A biblical mindset is dependent on the Holy Spirit. You know for a fact the reality. Remember in Philippians 4, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Your mindset is not one of helplessness because you know you can do all things through Christ. Look at the victim mindset. You focus on yourself, always feeling sorry for yourself. You see yourself as a victim. A biblical mindset is you focus on God. You realize God is bigger. God is able. It's not dependent on our strength. It's not about us. It's about Him. A victim mindset is always negative. It focuses on the problems. It's critical. It's always complaining. For example, when you look at this glass of water, how do you describe this? A negative mindset will always say, that glass of water is half empty. A positive mindset will say, the glass is half full. Half empty, half full. Talking about the same thing, but different emphasis. A biblical mindset focuses on the positive. Thankful, grateful. It reminds me of the hummingbird and the vultures. 
What's the difference between a hummingbird and a vulture? If you go to the desert and you ask the hummingbird, what do you see? The hummingbird will see flowers. You know why? Because it's always looking for flowers. A vulture will see what? It focuses on dead animals. So a vulture will see what it wants to see. Dead things. Christians. Followers of Jesus. What kind of mindset do you have? In order to recalibrate the mind of Elijah so that he will learn to recognize who God is, I'd like you to remember the acronym CAST. C-A-S-T. This is taken from the book of 1 Peter. When the Bible tells us, cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. In order to really recognize who God is, to have a renewed, recalibrated mind, the application is cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Notice God wants us to know. He cares for us. So C-A-S-T, cast, has the following letters. C, think of the word care. God cares for you. A, almighty. God is almighty. Nothing is impossible with you. S, God is not only almighty. He is sovereign. He is in control. He determines your future. He determines the destiny of nations. No accidents. God is in absolute control. T, God is trustworthy. You can trust him. But in order to accomplish the idea of recalibrating your mind and to respond properly, to recognize God, God did the following. You will notice in the life of Elijah. God wanted Elijah to have a fresh encounter with him. So what did you notice? God took the initiative to send an angel to provide food, to provide water. Why? Because God wanted Elijah to know, I love you, I care for you. Let me ask you a question. Do you believe that God cares for you? That God has your best interest at heart? Why did God ask Elijah to go to this mountain? Look at verse 11. He said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord was passing by. God wanted Elijah to have a real encounter, a fresh encounter. And look at the next verse. The Bible tells us, The Lord was passing by a great and strong wind. The wind was so strong, it was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks. Imagine breaking the rocks, breaking the mountains. What kind of wind has such power? He did not stop there. The Bible tells us, But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. Can you imagine the power of an earthquake? What can move? The earth. Tremendous power. But the Bible says God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. Can you imagine what Elijah was experiencing? The wind, the earthquake, and the fire. But what's amazing was this. The Bible says, and the Lord was not in the earthquake, not in the fire, not in the wind. Where was the Lord? And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. The gentleness of God. It is now talking about the grace of God. God appeared in the most unusual way. Don't put God in a box. And that's why it is important to overcome depression. We need a fresh encounter of who God is. And when God spoke to Elijah, the Bible tells us, Elijah heard God's voice. 
he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And behold, a voice came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you notice the repetition? God wanted to recalibrate the mind of Elijah. And God asked him the same question. What are you doing here? I like to believe God is always wanting to talk to you. And many times he talks to us, not in always dramatic fashion. Strong wind, earthquake, fire. But many times in the quietness of your heart, God speaks to us. And God is asking you right now, some of you, what are you doing with your life? Where are you headed? You see, Elijah was not in the right place. He was the prophet of God. God has works for him. But he was retiring, hiding in a cave. Then Elijah answered the same thing. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel, have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. They seek my life to take it away. Here was Elijah again with the martyr complex, feeling sorry for himself. He repeats, Lord, I alone am left, which is not true. They seek my life. Yes, partly true. Only one person wanted to seek his life. Jezebel. Can anybody take away the life of Elijah without God's permission? You see, God has to recalibrate his thinking. And the Bible tells us to solve that, God showed up to show him that he's almighty. God wanted Elijah to know he's not only almighty, God is sovereign. He's in control. What do we mean? Look at the next verse. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 15. The Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you have arrived, you shall anoint Hazel, king of Aram, Jehu, the son of Nimsi, you shall anoint king over Israel, and Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now, Elijah was running away from Ahab. He was running away from Jezebel. He was running away from his mission. And God is saying, go back, go, return. You need to do the following. You see, my friend, many times we fail to realize the obedience is also empowering. What do I mean? Do you wait until you feel like obeying before you obey? I have discovered that it is better to obey and then feeling will come. Remember the principle, motion before emotion. If you wait for emotion to come before you obey, it will not come. Forever you'll be giving excuses why you should not obey the Word of God. But if you want to have victory over depression, I'm not telling you right now. Follow God's way. Obedience first. Emotion will follow. God tells Elijah, justice will eventually be served. How? Verse 17, it shall come about. The one who escapes from the sword of Hazel, Jehu shall put to death. The one who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall put to death. Yet, I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, God wanted Elijah to know, Elijah, your perspective, your thinking is wrong. You need to correct your thinking. I am the God of history. I am in control. The ministry of Elijah did not end in chapter 18, when he brought a tremendous victory over the false prophets. In fact, 1 Kings chapter 20, 21, as you continue reading, you will notice how God used Elijah, 
to confront Ahab and to confront Jezebel. The Bible tells us Elijah delivered a solemn warning for Ahab and his wife Jezebel. Elijah was no longer afraid. Elijah was no longer depressed. What changed him? An encounter with God. After this encounter, Elijah was a changed man. Success is not always seeing the results. Success is being faithful to God. It's being obedient. And that's what Elijah did. Elijah did not see the eradication of Baal worship in his lifetime. Guess what happened? In the lifetime of Elisha, his successor, the Bible tells us the worship of Baal was totally eradicated. Elijah's life was not over. God told him, you now develop Elisha. The latter years of Elijah were so impactful, but he could not see it in his own lifetime. He did not realize that what God will accomplish through his ministry in the life of Elisha. You will notice how God helped Elijah get out of depression. He's telling Elijah, go out of your own little world. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. I have a purpose for you. Think of others, serve others. Go, anoint Elijah. The key in overcoming depression many times is when we think of others, when we begin to serve others. That's what Elijah did. He served others. You have to correct your thinking. How? Do you believe that God loves you, that God cares for you? Do you really believe that God is almighty? Nothing is impossible with God. Are you willing to cast your problem upon the Lord? Do you really believe that God is in control, including your past failures? Do you really believe that God has everything in control, including the future destiny of nations. Many times, we fail to relax. We fail to be rested. You know why? We do not know God. But God is saying, rest upon me. I am in control. Psalm 56 tells us the importance of trust because God wants us to trust Him. When I am afraid, from time to time, we can become fearful. What must you do? Assume responsibility. So what must you do? I will put my trust in you. That's our responsibility. David is saying, I will put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God, I put my trust. So to trust God includes trusting His word. Elijah heard the word of God. Elijah heard God telling him what to do. In God whose word I praise. You cannot separate trusting God with trusting His word. In short, there is no shortcut to studying God's word and learning to trust Him. They go together. In God I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? Do you notice what happens? First, when I'm afraid, I will trust God. Now, as you grow spiritually, this is what will happen. In God, I put my trust. I shall not be afraid. You can go through life fearful, trusting God, fearful, trusting God, or you can go through life trusting God and no longer being fearful. So, look at the next verse of Psalm 56. How he progressed. This is how he progressed. This I know God is for me. Do you see? Knowing God, that God loves you, God cares for you. Do you know that God is for you? God is for me. God is on our side. In God whose word I praise. You need to trust God's word. They go together. In the Lord whose word I praise. A repetition. Can I separate? Knowing God and knowing his word. Trusting God, trusting His Word. In God I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? In short, 
eventually, life is a choice. You can choose to be a victim or you can be victorious. And the key to victory is trusting God. Recognize God. And how do you recognize God? Realize that God cares for us. Realize that God is almighty. Realize that God is in absolute control. And above all, to trust God, you have to really make a choice. He is trustworthy. Surrender everything to Him. It is like entrusting to Him the good, the bad, whatever is in your life. It's like cooking chicken adobo. How do you cook chicken adobo? Garlic. Garlic by itself does not taste good. It's awful. Paper. Oh, black paper by itself does not taste good. Vinegar. My goodness, vinegar by itself does not taste good. Soy sauce. You put garlic, soy sauce, all of this together, paper, and boom, adobo. It becomes good. The same thing with your life and my life. Are you willing to surrender your past? They may not be pleasant. Perhaps you've been abused. Perhaps people have cheated you. It's not good. Are you willing to surrender that to the Lord? You surrender your past, present, and your future. My friend, you will never know what God can do and will do in your life. But if you get stuck by being depressed and you don't move forward, you will miss everything. You and I are basically immortal here on earth until God calls us home. God's plan is always better than ours. If you read the experience of Elijah, after his fresh encounter with God, after after his mind was changed, after his understanding of God became so real, you know what he experienced? Elijah, who wanted to die physically, did not die. Look at verse 11. As they were going along talking, here was Elijah and Elisha talking. The Bible tells us there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind to heaven. Elijah was brought to the presence of God without dying. My friend, to overcome depression, you must realize the reality of who God is. God loves us. God is almighty. And God is in control. And above all, God has amazing plan for your life. Are we listening to the voice of Jezebel's? Jezebel, many times, are ideas inspired by Satan, inspired by the world. They are not from God. For example, Jezebel threatened to kill Elijah. If she really wanted to kill Elijah, she could have done it. But sometimes, threatening is more powerful because you paralyze the victim. Another voice you may hear is your own voice. For Elijah, he's saying he's useless. For Elijah, he's saying, I'm done. I'm a failure. Many Christians, if they're not careful, will describe themselves as failure. I'm no good. Nobody can use me. God will not use me. I give up. Don't listen to your own voice. Don't listen to the voice of Jezebels. Don't listen to the world. You must learn to listen to one voice. The voice of the Lord through His Word. That means you need to study the Bible. Because the Bible is God's Word and God's truth to us. No shortcut to overcome depression. To overcome negative emotions, you need to practice the discipline of not only studying God's Word, obeying God's Word. You see, to study and not to obey is very dangerous. You know why? It will develop callous 
And pretty soon, you don't hear the word of God anymore because you have developed callousness. So, what's my point? Learn to listen to the Lord by studying His Word, obeying His Word. And above all, you can only obey when you trust Him. Learn to trust the Lord. Claim His promises. Understand His power. Believe in His character. That He wants what's best for you. I suggest today you learn to listen to the voice of God. To listen to the voice of God, you have to spend time. You have to be intentional. Amid this pandemic, amidst your lockdown, spend time. Learn to listen to the Lord. And perhaps some of you are saying, you know, Peter, I've been depressed. I've been hiding my depression. Well, the good news is this. Don't have to be embarrassed. Even the best among us, including Elijah, experienced depression. I've asked my wife to share with us how she got out of depression. Let's welcome Diana. Peter asked me to share my experience with depression. The reality is that I have been through depression in the past. When I was depressed, I had thoughts like, how can I be like this? I know I'm not supposed to be like this. But the more I struggled to get out of depression, the more I felt like I was in quicksand and being sucked down under. There were times that um, I would just cry and feel so down. I thought that I was losing my mind. I thought that I was demon-possessed and that I'd lost my salvation. But I remember one day I fell down on my knees and I said, Jesus, I can't do this. I can't get myself out. But you have promised that you would keep my faith. So I ask you, pull me out. That night I went to sleep. And the next day I was pulled out. So that was a depression before I got married and it went into the first year of my marriage. But the reality is that there are other times when I begin to feel down and thoughts have come to my mind. I'm, being, I'm getting depressed again. But what do I do? I recalibrate my thinking. I renounce that thought in Jesus' name because I know that when I'm filled with the Spirit, that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So what would I do? I'd renounce that thought, and then I would turn to God and I'd say, Lord Jesus, take control of me right now. I claim the power of your Holy Spirit in my life, and I claim joy. I turn on God's Word. I have an audio Bible, so I will go through the Bible. I'll lay down in the bed, so I'm resting. I listen to all the whole book of Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and I start claiming God's promises. And by the time I finished it, I'm revived and I'm worshiping God. So as what Peter said, we need to recalibrate our mind with God's word. We need to go to God with our problem. Don't hide in shame, but be transparent with him because the Lord said he's near to the brokenhearted. And he restores those who are broken in spirit. So Jesus is the answer to our depression. And on the practical side, every day I exercise in the sunlight because I know I'm prone to depression. So I exercise in sunlight. Every day I sleep seven to eight hours. Every day I watch my diet. You have to avoid things like too much sugar or things that are going to inflame you. So we have a part to play and I take omega-3 fish oil because that is a brain food and it's a mood regulator. So I do that on a daily basis. But ultimately, those things are just peripheral. What is central is that God is the strength of my life and my portion forever. Praise God for my wife sharing the reality. Negative emotions, depression can happen to anybody. But learn to deal with it. God's way. The Bible tells us our God loves us so much He died on the cross for your sins and for my sins. He loves you so much that He's saying, I will take care of you. Nothing to fear. I'm bigger than your fear. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But Jesus said, I came that you might have life, that you might have it abundantly. My friends, come to know the Lord. 
recognize his presence. Trust him because he came to give you life. Not to live a life of defeat, a life of depression, but a life, fullness of joy. A healthy Christian will have healthy emotions. And healthy emotions is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is amazing. Love. Wow. Joy. Peace. Patience. Kindness. Goodness. These are all positive emotions. But negative emotions, anger, bitterness, depression, this is not from God. And that's why I like you to make emotions your friend. Negative emotions is a warning light telling you something is not right between you and the Lord. Something is wrong. You need to take action. Don't deny it. Don't stuff it in. Don't blame others. Take action. If you want to surrender your depression, your worry, your anxiety, please pray with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I realize that many times you allow us to be disappointed. You allow us to go through negative emotions, to open our eyes, to show us what's wrong with us so we can become better. And I pray that because of today's message, your people will learn to recalibrate their thinking, to want to experience you more, to know you more, so that we can learn to trust you. To those of you who don't know Jesus, you have never entrusted your life to Jesus, why don't you pray this prayer right now? Lord Jesus, I need you. I've never entrusted my life to you. I've never entrusted my past. Today, I surrender to you everything. Help me to be rested upon you. I invite you as my master, as my Lord. Come into my life. Transform my heart. Help me to trust you completely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and Amen. If this has been meaningful to you, and if you have friends who are struggling with depression, or you are personally struggling with depression, we would love to chat with you. Remember, God cares, and we care for you too. Contact us. We'll be happy to connect you with people that can help you. Hello, CCF family. Welcome to another edition of CCF Sunday Fast Track. We are here with our senior pastor, Dr. Peter Tanchi, to answer the following questions. Pastor Peter, for our first question, you mentioned earlier that we should not listen to the voice of Jezebel or the voice of Satan and that we should instead listen to the voice of God. In our world today where there are many distractions and influences, how can we know and how can we focus on the voice of God alone. I remember the verse that was taught by Jesus when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. The only way to counteract the lies of the other voices is to know the truth. And in that chapter, Jesus talks about his word. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So there's no shortcut, Paul. You need to study God's word. And Jesus says, if you abide mm. in my word, then you will know the truth. Mm. You see, knowing the truth will require not just studying, obeying. Mm. For the second question, for those people who have overcome depression, how can they stay victorious? This is what I call the principle of daily discipline. You see, many times we like the idea of I take a pill and forever I'm okay. That's a lazy approach. But you don't find that in this world. Nothing. Even your body. You are a swimmer. You want to be a good swimmer. You need to continue practicing. In any sports, the same thing in the Christian life. You need to constantly practice spiritual discipline. 
because the reality is what? Christianity is daily. Daily practice, daily time with the Lord. So, to answer your question, no shortcut. To continue being victorious, you need to continue walking with the Lord, abiding with the Lord, listening to the Lord, obeying the Lord. And if you make a mistake, confess it, repent, and move forward. Remember the principles of the Bible. You need to be part of a community. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's why it is imperative you are part of a small group. It's imperative you have accountability in a Bible preaching church. You have leaders to help guide and protect us. So all of this is crucial. Thank you, Pastor Peter. And now for our third, last, and most controversial question for today. Pastor Peter, some of our netizens are asking, is taking your life, suicide, a sin against God? Number one, you have to realize God owns everything, including your life. Therefore, you have no right to take it. Number two, God commands us. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not kill. It's a command from God. And lastly, it is Satan who wants you to kill yourself. Because the only way he can destroy you is to plant those thoughts in your mind. So please, every time you are tempted to take your own life, you got to run away. It is totally not from God. So when that thoughts enter your mind, you must rebuke it. You must renounce it. Take every thought captive. Beautiful reminder, Pastor Peter. And for those of you who are thinking, but the Bible, the Bible characters that I follow got depressed and they wanted to die. Excuse me. They did not take their lives. They prayed and they got corrected. That's it for Sunday Fast Track. Thank you once again and see you next Sunday. As a family, as a small group, my prayer is you will take this time to discuss among yourselves the following question. Number one, what fears do you have that make you want to run or give up? Ask yourself, what are you afraid of today? Instead of running away, you need to face them. Question number two, what can you do to have a biblical mindset? How do you develop a correct mindset? And lastly, how can you become more sensitive to the prompting to the voice of God in your heart? What are some disciplines you can practice so that you can become more sensitive to the voice of the Lord? Have a blessed discussion time. Thanks for watching. We would like to invite you to be a Christ-committed follower by being part of the movement as we honor God and obey His Great Commission. To find out if there's a CCF satellite near you, log on to www.ccf.org.ph satellites. We also want to encourage you to join a small discipleship group where you can deepen your knowledge and love for Jesus and others. To sign up, log on to www.ccf.org.ph slash discipleship group. All of CCF's video resources are available free of charge and are constantly being improved by our team. Would you consider supporting CCF through prayer and giving so more people can be blessed? You can give securely through our website at www.ccf.org.ph slash give. For more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Thanks and God bless.